Hey, listeners. Hey, big listeners. Yes. Did you enjoy that, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> this is your top of the show reminder to join our Patreon. Now, Patreon is a way that you can give monthly. I know sometimes people are a little bit confused about that. They're like, wait, I was already charged. Why am I being charged again? It's a monthly contribution. So you can give $1, $2, $5 a month. And as you know, we do a book giveaway each month. So this month, our Patreon winner of the book, The City We Became by N.K. Jemison. Our winner of that book is... Is, give me a cute little drum roll, baby. The winner is Jazz. Jazz. We love jazz. You've been trying to get me to read Jazz by Toni Morrison a long time, and that's like the one thing I'm yeah. like, this is always on my to-do list. I need to get to it, but Jazz, we love you. I'm going to be messaging you in the Patreon streets, so be sure to answer that message so we can get this book to you. Now let's Oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're waiting on you to take your sip of water. Go ahead. Okay. If you would like to join our Patreon, be sure to find those links in the episode notes. And if you're like, Amber, I just want to give one time, one time only, I'll drop some, you know, Venmo, Cash App, PayPal apps there as well. You know, if, if you want to just give the one time because you've been loving the show, we appreciate all forms of support. We appreciate all forms of support. <laughs> Can't talk. Now let's get the party started. Welcome to the opera. Kidding. Welcome to the Sci Fi Sci Under the Believe Podcast Network. Now, it's a podcast about black science fiction, fantasy, and staying on the same page of our marriage. Ooh, I love being married to my best friend. Today, for episode sexy, <laughs> sexy, today for episode sexy seven, <laughs> we'll be discussing the film The Waterman. We watched it on Netflix. That film is directed by David Oye Lowo. But before we do that, Ben, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Sorry. <sighs> uh, right. You want me to do more. Sorry. I, I thought we were doing the, it's the Apple Podcast is. ratings first. So I no. did a whole check-in and, and my notes weren't scrolled down to the check-in part. Oh, I'm doing great. I'm super excited because we're going to go to a science fiction convention together, Capricorn, February 3rd to February 6th. We'll be there on the 5th on a Saturday hosting a panel. We'll do a live podcast there, so y'all should definitely go. I'll be there on, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday doing some stuff, um, other stuff as well. So You know, Big Mama, she's only good for about one or two panels. Yeah, I mean, you'll, this... you'll probably do one, and just one day, too. So Yeah, but I'm carrying life. Yeah, you're carrying life. Yeah, you're, you're tired. But we do want to see as many Chicago listeners as we can. So if you are in town February 5th, we will drop all of that information in episode notes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, uh, our last episode was the first episode, I think, where we got a clean rating. I don't think we swore at all that entire episode. Are you sure? Yeah, Apple Podcasts gave us a clean rating. Usually we're what? super explicit. I don't know. Uh, so we turned some... it down. I guess the potential of us becoming parents has made us less Puritan or more straight edge or something. Less Puritan or more Puritan? Less, more Puritan, I guess. Yeah, more Puritan, yeah. I don't like that. Straight edge. So we got to be really dirty this episode. Just oh my gosh. I didn't even know dirty. they gave those out. That's how explicit we've been in every episode. Uh, but you're glowing. I am glowing. You're glowing too. You, and, I, and I think I know why. You got a, a new employer for the past five days. What are you talking about? You hired me. Oh, gosh. I was like... How has it been living with me for an extra three days? Oh, my goodness. You know what, Benjamin James? It has not been horrible to have you around. I'll, I'll let you explain in a second why you have been become my pseudo assistant. But uh, Ben has been home since last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, obviously all through the weekend uh, because of some stuff going on in Chicago. And he's actually been super helpful. I, I realized that, I don't know, sometimes it's hard for me to ask for help, you know, charge it to being the eldest child or just a perfect talent, if you will. But I've been really enjoying having you home. I'm super excited for this baby to come because then I can just or you around all day. It's great. You're yeah. like my own Cinderella. I yeah. love it. I'm your employer. That's what I've been telling people when I'm texting. Well, I'm, I'm like, your employer. 
Yeah, you're, yeah. You're my employee. I'm, uh, oh, no, no, yeah. I'm your employee, yes. There Do you feel go. like it's like a, like a, a, a Scrooge Bob Cratchit situation? No, it's more of like a, uh, I don't know, like a Samantha Jones and a Richard Wright situation. Well, Richard's her boss. Right. So who's Richard? Me. You're Richard. Wright. Oh, okay. I just wanted to be I'm clear because because you know, honey, I love Samantha Jones. You do. Like I'm Samantha dating the guy Jones. with the weirdest tasting spunk. Yeah, you've been binging Sex in the City. It's so good. You can't get enough of Sex and the City. Well, it's so refreshing to ha- like talk about masturbation in the '90s. Like that show actually did way more than people give it credit for. Yeah. But why don't you talk a little bit about why you've been home instead of at work making money? Oh yes. Yeah. So <laughs> our our classrooms are not being provided with all the cleaning supplies it needs. Uh, there were a lot of kids getting sick. Um, I got COVID, and I think the first day I came back from winter vacation, I was missing. Nine kids from one class, nine out of like, I think 25, four out of 16, five out of 18, five or six out of 18, and then maybe like uh, six out of um, uh, 21. And so, and then that's sort of been the same. So I'm missing about 30% of my students. And so CTU, Chicago's Teachers Union, sort of said, you know, until this COVID ends, we should be teaching from remote. Uh, And CPS, Chicago Public Schools, said, no, we want teachers to come in. And so there's been a standoff there. So on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I've been, like, trying to do work. Like, I'm not – I'm locked out of my Google Classroom. So I found a way – I got, like, some super nice shelves that I'm going to bring to my classroom. I'm going to get a carpet. Uh, I found some Legos I'm going to go pick up (laughs) for my uh, classes – and then I, uh, I, for about a year and a half now, I have a smart board that hasn't been replaced. So I worked on a grant for that. And uh, so I'm super, I mean, I did, I did stuff, uh, but it was also cool. You know, I mean, it sucked to be for the kids, like, because on Tuesday, my student, the students who came to school, they're like, we really don't want to go remote. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was really sad. Friends. They want to see their friends. And so, and I can't contact them. It's like very tricky. Uh, like I don't have access to my Google Classroom or my Google Docs to you know lesson plan. So I've been trying to. Anyway, I feel it's it's horrible. It's it's bad for the teachers. It's bad for the parents. Like imagine having a second grader. You can't fucking go to work. Yeah, they can't take care of it's, themselves it's all awful. day. I well the thing is, my opinion about it. Like CPS needs to provide resources for us to have clean rooms. I got Agreed. two. I've gotten two Lysol canisters for the entire year. Oh, <laughs> like kids have to bring in their own cleaning supplies. Or I've I've went and we you know I teach in Boys Town, uh, so I have access to like a Target really close. So I've you know during you know if I have an uh, an hour break, I can go run and grab supplies if I need it. So I, I'm near. I'm like I'm not in a food desert or anything like that. Uh, so it's easy for me to access stuff, but I've spent a lot of money this year on like different supplies, everything from, you know, uh, project supplies where kids made some really cool ziggurats, which was fun. Ta- uh, you've talked about the zig. I remember, I I remember we talked about that on the podcast. Oh, we did. Oh. Yeah. A little bit, but no, but you yeah. have been doing some great yeah, stuff with the kids and I, and I, I'm sure they miss you. Yeah. I Cause miss, I was going to send, um, no, I miss all of them. You know, I mean, you can keep it real. They might not hear this. Because you remember I told them, um, I told you, because, you know, TikTok sent us a cake for the new year or something. And I was like, take this for these yeah, kids. And then we decided, yeah, the kids would have loved it. I should have brought the, oh, the kids would have, they would have Would they freak. have loved that it came from TikTok? They or would have, have actually just like getting cake? Oh, that's oh so no, funny. they would have like lost their fucking shit. They would have been like, you got a TikTok cake, Mr. Wallen? Like, yeah, they're already fascinated. And I told them if we did uh, remote learning, I would have you jump on the call and uh, they would ask you questions. They want to talk to me? Yeah, they're like dying to talk to you. They know they th- me? Yeah, they think you're like the coolest thing ever. They watch the content? Well, they don't, yeah, they don't. Do their parents kids, kids, know that they watch yeah, the content? Uh, probably. Uh, one parent said that she thought I was, uh, during parent-teacher conferences, she's like, you and your wife are just absolutely hilarious. Oh, so I was like, okay, cool, cool. 
I can stop sweating. I know. I you sometimes know, you know we're as a, most of our episodes are explicit. explicit, explicit, X-rated. Well, you know, I used to teach high school as well. So back then, I was making some funny YouTube sketches and some shorts, and a uh, a parent came up to me and did the same thing, and was like. Thank, I'm, I'm glad, you know, Keontae's doing well in, your, well in your class, but I'm also a subscriber. I was like, oh, my goodness. Really um, so kids love it. That's great. Uh, <laughs> moving forward, we're going to go to Apple Podcast Rating Land. I want to remind you that we appreciate you stopping and writing us Apple podcast ratings so much that we had a rating come in that I'm going to read first and then Ben's going to respond to it um, because it gave him a little bit of feedback that he probably needed to hear. Okay. So here's an Apple podcast rating. Um, It says a ghastly good time. I really enjoy the rapport between Amber and Ben. I have been looking for a joyful podcast to lift me up on these tough days. Please keep up the amazing content. I have been binging the older episodes first and have loved them. I will say Ben's comments about mental illness and spirits in Eve's Bayou sounded a bit ableist. So shout out to Amber for correcting that real quick face palm. Now, before... I want to remind everybody what you said really quickly. So I'm just going to play a quick little clip about what you said, and then you're going to respond. Yeah, I'll respond. To your comments, okay? Yeah, Weird vibes yeah like or... the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, you know, you'll meet someone that you're like, I or I have met people that say that they can see spirits. It's hard to not believe that some of this is true like this woman she said like my cousin the woman says she has like full conversations with this girl so i believe her i guess i'm always hesitant when i hear these com- like when i hear this i'm like okay like maybe you have a mental illness that has yet to be diagnosed but maybe you don't ben all, all right, right benjamin thoughts <laughs> yeah so from that soundbite, I equated the belief in God and the belief in communing with spirits with mental illness. And I think that is incredibly disrespectful for people who actually are suffering from mental illness. Mm-hmm. And so I think I, for me, I, I confuse this idea of deception and mental illness, where I think uh, if you're told all your life that there is a God and you decide to believe in a God and you you think that God's talking to you. That's a result, I think, of deception, not necessarily of mental illness. So I'm glad that this... In uh, your experience. Yeah, in my experience. I, I have a very long, complicated history with uh, spirituality and my opinions about spirituality. And so I tend to be a little bit uh, antagonistic towards uh, people who have like deep spiritual connections and believe, especially believing and talking with God. Um, however, the ability, like me just communicating, like associating that with mel- mental illness is like incredibly disrespectful. I'm going to be Oprah for a second. So who, who was having that conversation? So, that? Say more about your past and, and what oh, your, maybe some I, specific I, details. Well, I've heard, you know, growing up as a Pentecostal, uh, you, there's lots of instances in my own life where. You know, family members have believed God spoke to them to do certain things that turned out to be unhealthy for them and are unhealthy for other people in their life. And so I, I tend to be a little bit, um, you know, as I said, antagonistic. And uh, and I, I think also I get upset because people, but one, like the belief, the on the non-Christian belief, uh, for example, a Pentecostal might say might call someone crazy for believing that a person talks with or demon. They might say they're crazy or they're being possessed by demons if that person uh, believes that they can talk to spirits. Right. So a pe- Pentecostal okay. person might say voodooism is evil and sort of uh, and there or they might say that person has mental illness. And so for me, I'm like, I'm like, well, you sort of do the same thing. You just. Right. Yeah. So you mean like a, a, a Pentecostal person talking to God? Yeah. Versus, I think, yeah. you know, what's the difference between talking to God? And of course they would, they would explain, well, there's a difference between a God and the demon, obviously. Uh, or, or, but they wouldn't address like the talking to part. Yeah. I, I don't know. 
Uh, I think name names, Ben. Who in your family specifically is talking and made poor decisions? What kind of like? What do you think? Some things that they were deceived by? Uh, yeah. So uh, my father felt like God told him to go and start a church and build a house. That was like a really terrible financial decision. And he and my dad said, "Oh, now when he looks back at it, he's like, oh, I guess I misheard from God.'" And I'm like, I want to like. Say no, because God doesn't talk to people. So how much money did the man lose? I'm just kidding. I know. It's, <laughs> it's significant. You know what? Let's not. Yeah. Because we don't, don't we don't want to get the crying this uh, early. But yeah. And I also went to a Pentecostal uh, church where people said like, you know, um, uh, if <laughs> you have diabetes, I remember someone saying like, you have diabetes. I probably brought this story up before. Like you have diabetes because you don't have enough faith in God. Ah, yeah, those girls, the Gwen Shamblins of like, if you right. just stop eating, you'll get into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, so I have a... Uh, <laughs> Calories and Christ, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think there's this ma- me as a a full-blown atheist. I believe there's a mass deception, and that has nothing to do with mental illness. Yeah. So. It's interesting because... You know, we are so different in many ways. So I don't really identify as a full-blown atheist. Like, as you know, I'm very, I wouldn't call myself very spiritual. Like, we currently don't go to a church or anything. But I definitely, like, believe there's, like, a higher power or some sort of universe or some sort of something out there bigger than myself. And I definitely believe there's a blueprint I should live for my life. That's not always the Bible. Sometimes that's yoga. Sometimes that's flaming Hot Cheetos. Thing. But yeah. I don't believe that there's nothing out there. But well, but you but you differ, well, and that's it, that's something that is not a point of contention in our relationship. It's not. But also, I think you're tapping into a misconception about atheists because atheists do believe there's things out there. It's called the universe, right? We believe, right. you know, we believe in science. We believe it's just that the there are God stars, specifically. Okay, that there's a, a a great entity that has you know created all of this. Based I, on I, my definition, do you think I'm an atheist? Uh, no, I, I think you believe in your spiritual. I don't believe in a spirit. I don't, I deny this idea of, um, a soul, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, I remember the first time I asked you, I was like, do you believe we're soulmates? You were I'm like, like no. no, I was I like, <clears throat> oh, it's getting hot in here. God. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just, I don't, I deny the existence of a soul. I uh, hear you. And I think you do believe in a soul, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, you're you're a bad atheist if you are one. <laughs> All right, moving along. I, I I don't have a segue for this. Why don't you talk about why we chose to watch this movie? You actually, I love you to death because you are able to help out, and so you did plan our content calendar ahead for the month. So why don't yeah. you talk to me about like what you were thinking when you chose to watch sure. The Waterman? So I was uh, suffering from pregnancy insomnia. Uh, finish your statement. So when Amber and I both got COVID, I was having trouble sleeping. I had to sleep with like uh, pillows propped up because there was drainage in my throat. Like, okay. You know. Spare them the details, please. Uh, well, you know, it's probably going to happen to you. Everyone's going to get this illness, uh, and get vaccinated, get boosted because your illness will be a lot less intense if you're vaccinated and boosted. Yeah. But you didn't sell it well or, uh, with all that in your throat. Oh yeah. Then. Anyway, but I was still <laughs> able to work. So okay. that, yeah, so I am suffering through COVID, and uh, I, I drank all the bleach, and that wasn't <laughs> helping. So I went ahead and started planning for the sci-fi site, and I found this awesome uh, website called Local Dot Black, and it's about uh, it just shows like black businesses, black artists, black directors, and so I found like all black. It was like black films, star, you know, starring black actors. And so I went through and I found the Waterman and I read this description uh, and I was like, oh, this is this is perfect. This is exactly right up our alley. And it turns out that it's not really um, or it may be or it sort of fits in that in between space. So, uh, yeah, that's that's how I discovered it. And, and that actually website gave me a lot more um, other films that we're going to you know dive into in the future. So I'm excited. OK, yeah. cool. So, <clears throat> oh, both of us is, <clears throat> is a mess. Okay, so you want to give a quick background about what it's about? Uh, why don't you do that? Because I just talked. Right. Okay, I can do that. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna spitball. So there's this 
this kid, his name is Gunner, and he is played by the the child who I, I'll find his real name in a second. But he's an incredible actor, and he's played by the same child that was in This Is Us. And um, him and his mother are very, very close. And um, spoiler alert! Spo- <laughs> sorry, Ashley. Spoiler alert! Um, he finds out that his mother has cancer, and he's watching her battle with cancer. And then he learns about this mythical figure, or like you know. Uh, urban legend if you will called the waterman in his town and the waterman is supposed to be immortal so he goes on a hunt to find the waterman but also as that is the backdrop for the story um he has a father who is like a a macho navy man and his father is struggling to take care of his um ailing mother but also definitely struggling to like build this connection with his son like his son's really into like graphic comics and drawing and he's like hey son you want to talk around the football you know and his son's like you don't even know me so they have this strange relationship so the son eventually runs away to go find the water man and the dad uh, he the dad goes looking for his missing child in the town as he's short also balancing, like taking care of the ailing mother. Should I tell the mother that this child has ran away now? Cause she already knows about this strange relationship that I have with the child, but that's basically what the story is about. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a great summary Amber, <clears throat> to the fucking point. Was that okay? It was great. Uh, the, he does, uh, the little boy, his little boy's name is played by Lonnie Chavis. So and good. And he uh, gets, you know, a friend to help him find the waterman, a, a girl uh, named Joe. And sort of she says, oh, I know where the waterman is. And so he goes off with her. That's the, that's the only other, I think, plot point. But yes. Now, great. Joe also is, um, she doesn't really have the same family dynamic that Gunner has. Uh, Joe is basically living like in a tent. She's homeless right yeah. now. She's, she's um, like 13. A, she's 13. She's homeless. She's sort of estranged from her father. And so every day, basically like the way that she hustles and makes money is she tells these tales of the water man. Like y'all want to hear, I, I met him once. I got the scar on my neck to prove it. Like cough up the money right now. And I'll tell this story, which I love pay, pay storytellers and creators, mm-hmm. you know, hustle. So then one day he's like, I'll give you all my money. If you go on this journey with me to find the water man. And she, you know, she she takes his money, and then well, lo and behold, <laughs> this bitch ain't never seen the water man in her motherfucking life. Obviously, obviously, uh, but that's okay, um, because we've all told a lie. You know, <laughs> uh, this film reminded me a lot of two other movies that I really, really like, called uh, "I Kill Giants," based off of a graphic novel, and I have some uh, fan artwork of that graphic novel. I love it, and it's about a girl struggling. You know, spoiler alert, struggling with her mom's cancer. And then also A Monster Calls, which is about a boy struggling with his mom's cancer. And both of them, you know, meet monsters that sort of help them throughout the way. So it there's this idea of the child confronting the monster that becomes a metaphor or maybe not a metaphor for the, the, the you know, in all these cases, the mom's cancer. Yes. Uh, which I thought was like and her very, healing journey. Yeah, it, it's sort of you know, and these are all for kids. These are all kids' movies. Uh, yeah, I think they're all kids' pe- movies. Deal with parent death a lot. Yeah. Another spoiler alert coming up here. Well, you don't know what I'm about to spoil, but we saw the uh, the good dinosaur recently because you know yeah, Ben's so been dragging the fuck out of me every time. He's like, you know, not real Pixar movies until you've seen the good dinosaur, yeah. which many people have not seen. So we watched it, it was so good. and it was so good, and it also dealt with. Um, parent death again spoiler but it was really really good so we we were just inundated with parent death all weekend yeah, long I think if one of us dies a one you know uh, raising a child I think we're we'll be very much prepared because we've seen a, <laughs> the good ben, dinosaur because you know you've had a lot of like maybe this is TMI but we've talked in our 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 therapy sessions about like oh the, i have nightmares like, of you dying in childbirth the, yes like we'll talk to our therapist and and our doula's like what's so what's some some fears and anxiety y'all have and ben will be like i'll go first and i'm thinking like finances uh no. <laughs> fetus things and ben's like well my main concern is amber dying during childbirth and i'm like Oh, okay. That is, I that mean, just that set is the my, tone for the meeting. That is my greatest fear, and I, I've had nightmares. It's anxieties about that. That you know, because honestly, like we could be 
you know, we could have financial woes, we all these things, but we have families that can support us. We have extended families that can support us. We could, you know, I could lose my job, but, you know, you have a job or you could lose your, you know, they could delete TikTok tomorrow, but <laughs> I have a job. So all these things are just like we could, you know, you could have a fire to our apartment, which would be horrific, but these are just all physical things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, though, I don't really... <clears throat> I mean, yeah, sure. I, I'm looking at these books on the shelf. I do love I, these books. Some of them are signed by authors I care about and I've met. But if I, all of that were to be gone, you know, that's replaceable. But you are not replaceable. So that is like my, my number one fear. And so it was really... Are you worried about not having support for the child? Or are you worrying about like... I mean, who the am magic I gonna, that is who am I that, gonna, the magic that is M from Marche yeah, Thomas Wallen being well, just like you know, it's sort of when you have like a best friend, and you know, <laughs> why am I why am I crying? <laughs> I do think about this. Yeah, should we take a break? No, no, no. But uh, yeah, that's like your you know when you have a uh, you know your soulmate. <laughs> See. <laughs> Bitch, you do believe in souls. <laughs> when you got your soulmate and like, or like, you know, when I read a book, like we're reading a book together um, and I'm like, this book is so good. And there's, and I just can't wait to discuss it. We're going to do it for the, uh, the sci-fi side podcast. It's a big book. Uh, and I'm getting to, we're reading the book separately, but I, when, when I read a great line, you sort of just like want to lean over it and like, be like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I can't, that would be so hard. So, um, you know, David uh, Oyelo, uh, uh, nope. <laughs> how do you say it? Oye Lowo. Oye Lowo. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. But he, he's really, str he's struggling more than um, uh, Lonnie Chavis's character, Gunner. Uh, so uh, there's Mary, who's the mom who's suffering from cancer and Amos is just like wants to do everything he can to support Mary. And there's this really intense scene where um, Mary is like throwing up at night. And so Gunner, her son gets up, sees Mary throwing up and, uh, and he, and all of a sudden Gunner starts to have a, like an emotional make breakdown. Yeah. Just a very visceral reaction yeah, to and being he's like, like oh, he's my like, mother. Getting, he's getting like an, a panic attack. And Amos gets really angry at his son for not understanding. Like you're like, why are you upset? You're not the one that's sick. Your yeah. mom and sort of shakes him. And that is a, and you see that like, Oh, like Amos and Mary are like very close. They are like, best friends they love each other mm -hmm. and and mary's main concern is making sure that her son can get through um her cancer like she's less concerned about her her cancer where amos her her lover her her husband you know the father of her child is more concerned about mary you know and just like it just this film brought up you know as a soon-to-be parent you know dropped a lot of a, a you know yeah, I was like, oh my, I can't even think of, I don't even want to think about it, but it was, I think these films are good though, right? Because these, yeah. because even, you know, God, you know, I'm, this is not, we're, n both of us are very healthy, you know, I ran three she, miles this morning. <laughs> As we coughing from COVID last episode. We're very we're, healthy. We are in the big peak We're health. healthy. <laughs> we're doing great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not everyone has that. I think these films sort of, help kids, help people, you know, if we write, you know, in our life, we're going to meet people who might have lost a parent. Um, and, and these films can sort of help us approach that in a caring, loving way. And I think uh, the Waterman does that in this really incredible way. So, yeah. And it's, it's two different stories of grief because it is, <clears throat> or like a beginning stage of potential grief for Amos and no, Gunner Amos and his mother and then there's also the water man who is this mythical creature who is immortal oh, yeah. who is a widow what you call it yeah it, when's a, a man is still a widow right yeah yeah he's I'm a tripping he's a widow yeah yeah so he lost his wife and he's immortal so he came back to life so he is set up to lose everyone in his family um but he 
the, the myth that is him is that he stalks the forest uh, just looking for his wife, yeah. which is also a story, you know, just about like, it, it, it tells a bigger story of like, would you rather have everlasting life and see everybody around you die or would you have a short life with the one you love, which is something that they address directly yeah. in there. Yeah, that's, um, that's the essential question you, you, what you could say about the whole yeah. The whole film, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's take a quick break. Sure. Hey, friends. It's Amber here. So I'm not sure when you're listening to this podcast, but for us right now, it's January 11th, and I am planning something for Black History Month 2022 for Black business owners and Black creators. So on my personal handles, my goal is to shout out a Black business every single day of Black History Month. So 28 days, 28 Black businesses. Now, patrons, I gave you access to the Google form that you can use to sign up if you are a Black business or please share that if you know a black business but that form will be open to other people very very soon i'm gonna be sharing that with all of my followers so if you are a black business contact me via instagram or our social media handles so that i can send you that information because i want to showcase you especially listeners especially big time supporters so black history month is coming up how are you giving back how are you staying black uh, so yeah, that's the <laughs> that's the ad. Uh, celebrate Black History Month, February twenty twenty two. Now let's get back to the show. How are you staying black? Is yes. that like a question for everybody, Amber? It seems a little strange. It's a question for everybody. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and answer it right now? I will not answer that question. Are you, are you supporting blacks in yes, your life? Blacks, <laughs> blacks with a Q. Blacks. I'm supporting you. Yes. And and black companies and black authors and yeah, how support it? I just name, watched, name one thing I just gave a stream <laughs> to a, a black director. I'm just kidding. All right, I, let's let's get in. Hoping. Let's get back into this. All right, so I want to get into town legends because the family it's a black family. They move into this small town, and you you know in lots of small towns there are these legends. And I was curious if you've ever had like a small town legend. Hmm. As you're as you're th- keep thinking about it, I'll share mine. Yeah, do it. So I went to a school, Nyack College, and it was recently sold. The campus was sold in Nyack, which is a small town up, uh, sort of right outside the Bronx, about thirty minutes. And now it's just in Manhattan. I think the campus, but. If you go to Nyack, there are these places called the Witch Tunnels. And there was a whole... Uh, you can go there. They're very scary and bizarre. They were originally shooting ranges during the Cold War. But there's a myth, an urban legend, that there are witches who go there and like sacrifice goats and stuff. And there's like really scary graffiti. It, it sort of looks like uh, the abandoned building that you see in The Waterman. Which sort of made me think of, uh, you know, the witches' tunnels. I, I really want to take you to Nyack and show you the witches' tunnels. It's a really qu- cool, quaint town. Truman Capote and Carson McCullers had a house up there. Um, yeah, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, kind of an opportunity miss for wedding venues, huh? Yeah, I mean, we. <laughs> oh yeah, it would have been a good wedding. It's expensive because it's so close to New York City, but I wouldn't want. Yeah, you know, I'm kidding. I don't want to go up there and get married with them, which is used to slice up goats. Well, I'm saying the town itself is very, very cute. Oh, got it. Very cute. You did the say library, it's I love the library. Tony Morrison used to you know, would do uh, speaking events at the library. Mm. Um, really great and it, you could go see her for like 15 20 bucks gosh i so, cannot you remember when i found out tony morrison died and i was on the cta and yeah I you sobbed. were just sobbing yeah yeah and i think there were maybe like one or two other black people on the train on the seat on the bus that were like i know why she's crying but everybody else was like okay you know like the person yeah. sitting next to me was like you good i'm like no tony morrison i, I was talking <laughs> to a friend last night uh, who uh, was telling, you know, I, I was sort of flamed recently because I was saying that I can't wait to be a parent because I'll be able to just hold the baby and read. And we were like, you're not going to have all this reading time. So what I was talking to my uh, friend, Bethany, who is a mom and her, her, uh, her you know, kid uh, um, was not going to sleep. Uh, I, don't, I was going to say the kid's name. No, I, I, just don't. Yeah, I won't say the kid's name. Her, her kid was not going to sleep. And she 
I ended up just reading all of Octavia Butler's work, like everything. Of course. And and it sort of just got her through her child's insomnia, uh, her second Which child's insomnia. did nothing insomnia. but give you ammo. To, to yeah, like, so I was like, Bethany, this is like the greatest, the greatest thing I've heard. And then she's like, oh, I, and just, and so she went to, you know, just write a thank you. She ended up writing a thank you letter and then tried to find, you know, Octavia Butler's address. And then she found out Octavia Butler had died after she had just spent months reading her, all her work. And, and then she just ended up sobbing for like a day. Now, Bethany, Octavia been. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. But that is sad. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard when somebody, you know, Cindy, Sydney Poitier just died and we were talking about like, wow, this is one of the first, like, it's, it's very telling that times, because people love to say like, back in the day, it's so long ago, racism and segregation yeah. and whatever was like, but the first Hollywood black actor like just died like yesterday. So yeah. what, what do you mean it's been so long? Um, but I did think really quickly about. Oh, yeah, or, town, or town, town legend. Myth. So this Give us wasn't in Athens. My, this oh, wasn't no. in Athens, okay. but my mother is from Eatonton, Georgia. Oh, yeah. Okay? Give us and Eatonton. so if you're listening and you're from Eatonton, I might miss a, a couple details here or there. But so there's this church that is said to be haunted by this ghost named Sylvia. Have I told you about Sylvia? No, this sounds fucking mm. awesome. Okay, so Sylvia was a bride. She was happy. She was beautiful. Sounds like you. She was excited. It was the day of her wedding, but she still had like a couple of jitters and things like that. So she walked down the aisle. She married this incredibly handsome man. And then they like dance and the rice was thrown and things like that. And they went to cut the cake, the wedding cake, because that's what you do at your wedding. You eat lots of cake. It's like one of the reasons you should get married. And it's the only reason. Something happened. I think her husband was like, now's my opportunity to really get rid of her. And so... Wait, wh- wh- out of know, nowhere? Out of nowhere. I don't know. Husbands just killing their lives, their wives, as they and do. And their lives. That was and a their lives. mistake to make. That's how husbands it always, you husbands ever, killing their wives. Snapped? That's how it always happens. And so he ended up like maneuvering it where he was able to like stab her right in the chest, but nobody could really see it because they're like excited and taking oh, pictures yeah. and throwing the cake. So she died right there with a, a knife through her heart on her Ooh. wedding cake. Sounds like so the, the opening of Scream 2. Oh, it does. Where, it? Yeah, where, it, spoiler alert, where, uh, you know, the two black characters are literally murdered in a room full of people in a movie theater. Yeah. So, so Sylvia is this ghost that like haunts this church with a dagger through her heart Ooh. as she's trying to explain to people like, I didn't kill myself. It was my husband. It was my husband. But like no one believes her. No. Wow. Well, That's... she's she died in real life. But then so people will say they they see the ghost in the like bride's dress, Shit. like walking around the grounds with a with a knife through their heart. I, see, I, I love. So, OK, we live in a city, which is fantastic. But this film takes place in this small town and there's. This like small town feel that I I I I somewhat miss growing up in upstate New York, Rensselaerville. Like for example, there's a bookstore owner that um, Gunner goes to, and the bookstore owner is like giving him all these books. And there's just this very like you know ki- there's very intense kindness. At one point, he goes and talks to um, this author who knows all about the Waterman. And the author is just like very, you know, uh, you know Alfred Molina, who uh, plays Doc Ock in the Spider-Man movies. And this old man is like just sharing all these like stories about the Waterman and like offers him a cookie. And it's not creepy. It's not weird. And, oh, he, and I love stories from older people. Yeah, it's yeah. It's so best. it's so it's just. But there's a quaintness about this town, um, and I. I yeah, I sort of, I, I like I love, that. I, you know, let, when I've been having my maternity ex- insomnia or pregnancy insomnia, whatever you want to call it, I've been reading just in the middle of the night or trying not to be on my phone in the middle of the night. And so I just finished this really great book that is just a, a old Southern Alabama midwife who's just telling the stories of like the hundreds of thousands of babies that she's given life to this old wow. black lady and just sort of how... There was a time where like all the black midwives in the South were laid off and it's just, oh, I love, I love when old people tell stories. They could tell stories about like, 
you know, the candies they keep in their pockets. And mm-hmm. I'm just like sitting back those, and listening. Those strawberry gummy filled candies or the, the hard or the caramel, caramel like, the hard oh, caramel a, a that just sticks around your uh, face when they give you kisses. I love old people. Oh. Sm- I, I hope one day to be a grandmother passing out little caramel candies. Uh, I do want to say really quickly that so as the story moves on, Gunner and Joe, like obviously Gunner is on this quest with Joe and uh, he- With a like, fucking samurai sword. With a samurai sword as one brings. And he discovers like, you know, you didn't, you've never met the Waterman at all. You know, he's he has a, a yeah, really obviously good- Obviously Joe is lying yeah. because he's she's trying to get money from kids to, uh, to tell this legend about the Waterman. But yeah, go. Correct. Um, and this kid is like a, a young Viola Davis. Like he, when this kid cries, I start crying. Like he, he actually, he just yeah. has star quality like that. Um, and so we, he later actually, he does meet the water man, but it's kind of weird. Like you don't really know if this interaction is in his head or it's, if it's happening in real life. And that is when he, you know, we think he's going to kill the water man. He's got the samurai sword. He's, it's been a hero's journey. Like, what's going to happen? Yeah, so the Waterman has this special stone, which mm-hmm. he learns from this old man uh, who tells him this story, that the special stone uh, allows you to bring back the be- the dead. Mm-hmm. So he meets the Waterman in this shack, and the Waterman is, like, dripping, like, just yeah. soggy. Truly scary. Yeah, very I scary. I had a hand over my mouth. I was, I was like, like Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, But keep going. Ooh, girl, you okay? Yeah, so he confronts the Waterman with this samurai sword, and... Obviously, he needs to kill the water man to get the stone because the water man is going to hold on to the stone until he can find his wife to bring his wife back from the dead. So, yeah, he, you know, he's he goes to fight uh, to fight the water man. Keep going. And he ends up not killing the water man because the water man convinces him like it's better to live a short life with the ones you love than a long life with without the ones you love. Like you don't want immortality, which is kind of always what's addressed whenever immortality is the thing like when we what do we watch it's not the old guard like we Mm -hmm. we've discussed some immortality on the show so then you know gunner is rescued by his father and he goes back home and then that's pretty much it yeah for me so it's if we're talking you know you didn't ask me this directly but if we're talking first impressions you know how I am, Ben. I need some motherfucking steaks. Mm. Don't show me no a, sword. A mom, a mom with cancer yeah, so is not. It's not enough steaks. So, like I, I'm, but if the, the if the mother doesn't die, like I think it's clear that she's on her way out. E- yeah, but I don't know. I learned as a, a very young reader and a very young movie watcher that if somebody is sick in Act One, they asses are going to die. Like everything needs to be intentional. Like I, I don't, I don't like the false sense of like, well, this mom. Hey, listen, kids, this mom with cancer is living, so like everything's gonna be okay. Uh, yeah. So that's a that's a sigh for you. That's a sigh for me, as well as the samurai sword. Something's got to give. Yeah, the samurai sword wasn't ever used except ever. they they used it to cut open peaches at one point. Yeah, don't yeah. steal no samurai sword unless somebody's ass is going to get good at it. So uh, the the film also decides to make the decision that uh, it, it works in some ways really well. For example, they use mixed media. So Gunner is an artist and every time he draws, we see his his imaz- his um, his imagination come to life on the pages. And you're like, "Oh, that's so cool." It's like very beautiful, very compelling. And Gunner is working on a story about a detective who discovers his own body and has to, you know, find out who mur- who murdered him. And so he's working on that story throughout, you know, the the that film. The only murder there was. Too. Yeah. And then also when we learn about the water man, when the old the old man is telling Gunner the story, there's a flashback of like drawings that show, you know, the water man. It's very, very cool. Uh, and so I love that imagination. But the film sort of makes the decision, unlike I Kill Giants or A Monster Calls, uh, the film makes the decision that the water man is actually just in Gunner's mind. Yeah. Right, and and that Gunner needed to uh, create this story about the Waterman in his mind to deal with the trauma of his mom's sickness, and yeah. and in that way the film loses its fantastical element. Correct. Where I wish there was a little bit more of, 
you know, nebulous, a little bit more like, uh, like maybe it's Especially real, maybe it's not. Because yeah. we love when kids go on a freaking like Indiana Jones. We, we love that in Lovecraft Country. Yeah. It's like there's this one scene where they have a, a, a landslide of all these cockroaches and Ben was like, ah, something fantastical is happening. Finally, like it, it, the, the fantasy in the movie, another sigh, because we need to get back to doing the sighs would be like, more fantastical elements. Even if you're just putting it in his mind, like add some more of that would have been great. Yes. Yeah. If it was going to be in his mind, you could have done whatever then. Right. And there is a night scene where they uh, see these like creepy, they see horses running after them. There is an element of like fantasy. Um, there is, it starts snowing at one point in the forest. They're walking in, um, I think Oregon so very beautiful, you know, both of us just went to the Pacific Northwest for the first time. Mm-hmm. And there's a level of like Jurassic Park yes. likeness to, to that part of the country. Yeah. And uh, to see it snowing there was like very bizarre, but it turns out there's a forest fire. So it's and ember- like everything was justified, yeah. which is like, like in boo. improv and imagination and comedy, like don't justify it. You know how the, the, yeah. the adage is like, if a grandma, if, if, sorry, if somebody walks into a scene and they're like shaking and convulsing, don't be like, ah, grandma, you just didn't take your meds. Like, don't justify it. Like just start shaking with them and come up with something. But everything had a justification, which took the, the childlike element out of the imagination. Yeah, and the thing is that we do see the water man and his like right. waterlogged face. So you're sort of st- I, like I was still left wondering like maybe the water man is real and he ends Correct. up getting these little lodestones, essentially these special stones that are implied that the old man had put them around the forest, but he still has the stone. Right. So maybe, it, I don't know. And like and, and the what? mom does start feeling better. So maybe there is a fantastical element. I don't know. I, I just think that, I'm, I'll cut you off. No, no, that's it. I, I think, so, so there are movies that are done really, really well where the fantastical elements are super heightened and then everything's justified. One great example is The Sandlot, right? Like you do feel like the beast is this like yeah. huge mega thing and then you meet the dog Hercules and you're like, I, I can see how in a child's mind this happened. Right. The, uh, d- the decision was made not to make this a fantasy film in right. The Sandlot where I... F- where yeah keep yeah, going yeah where this is sold to us is like check out this fantastical film cuz i was i was i wanted them to hit that forest and it would be like narnia up in that bitch mm-hmm. like the full like don't don't try to justify like if if we're if we're exploring this through a child's mind like heighten everything yeah. the the bugs the grasses the everything and it, it probably didn't help that we had just watched the good dinosaur which was filled with like fantastical creatures and jurassic elements um but yeah and then my last big side would be like if you're gonna get rosario dawson on the casting sheet let her let rosario yeah. dawson you know what i'm saying like yeah I, she was a weak character great was, mom she was great mom and it's but not because character. she had cancer but there was something where we just were not connecting with her yeah weak character I, sh- development. I should care more about like a character has cancer you should care about them but there was it, yeah her character development and how it was written was weak yeah and so, there's like a tickle scene that was like cute but we needed more yeah, yeah like i wanted to sort of see maybe they could have used some flashbacks but her character development was not very strong and we know how strong rodos rodosio rodosio aoc um cortez so we know how strong Rosario Dawson is as an actor, as a singer, as a everything. So I was just kind of like, where? Something's yeah. just not clicking with her. Uh, but yeah, those are all of my big sides. This makes me really excited to parent and, uh, and or really excited to, not excited, really capable and prepared to process grief in the ways in which that I will need to at some point because yeah. we all are going to experience grief at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do want to point out... Um, as far as the small town, I do like small towns. There was something that, you know, we noticed. Uh, one, small towns are, you know, they tend to be more racist. They are racist. Oh, yeah, fun. Yeah. And so there wa- there's one <laughs> scene where a, you know, because at one point the father goes to the sheriff who's like very helpful and sheriffs in small towns tend to be more communal, whatever. And so they're Not going... to blacks with a Q. Right. I think, so my sense is that this black man is part of the Navy 
and they chose to live in a small town, which can tell us sort of what kind of black person this family is. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. I'm saying like maybe they're like re- they're like a black Republican more family, conservative. You're right. or, or <laughs> not, not even Republican, just more conservative. Like mm. when when you show that American biology. Maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe, right? Uh, and so I think there is this uh, this process called fencing. Anyway, but when this man starts to describe the girl that he saw with uh, the boy. He's like, oh, he's giving a description, and he doesn't say white. And, for and you those clock who did, that. Yes, for those who have not seen it, I'll say this: the the young black boy, he's the star of the film, and then his, you know, co supporting character is a little white girl. And so the sheriff was like, well, describe the girl that went missing with him. And he and the guy's like, oh, you know, blue hair, crazy scar on her neck. I'm like. Don't do all that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know what you would say. White. You know, uh, you wouldn't. You wouldn't say white. People you wouldn't. Just, the first thing Absolutely people not say in a small when town. you describe like who's gone missing. Not in a small town. And I think they. Oh, please. I, abs- because the default world for a white person is a white world. Uh, and I think I think that decision. I think that decision. It, it maybe you know, maybe it was. They missed it, but I think it was intentional. I don't think someone describing a missing person in a small town, they would, wouldn't would say white. They wouldn't say white. They would because that that's a given. But even when they ask, well, I guess obviously they're like, "Oh, your son's missing." Wait, he's black. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, and agree then, to disagree. But I just re- feel like when people go missing that are not connected to you, you give like race, height, weight. Like those are like the, you the do big- because you're you're a black person who sees the world as larger than yourself and larger than other black people but a white person again their their default world generally tends to be white and then that's one you actually think in a small town if some and if if it was a town of lots of different races well there wasn't they were the only black because in the beginning of the film the father's driving through the town and he he's like looking at all the people and he makes a comment during dinner like oh this town is weird and he makes a comment about the light fixture and for that I read that all as subtext is like, we're really the only black family here. You're right. I, I can concede on that. Uh, and then finally, the other thing that they deal with race is that uh, Joe's father is like mm-hmm. this racist. And there's a, a really subtle line that shows his That's racism. That's like the fifth thing wrong with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. He he's, 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 turns out to be abusive. And I think yeah. the way they handled race in this film was like the way America looks at race it's very subtle especially in small towns they don't want to talk about it it's sort of ignored and i think they they sort of hit the nail on the head in that in that sense as someone from being from a small town so i'd agree with that yeah well ben with that being said why don't you warp up the show all right in conclusion go ahead and watch the Waterman. it is a great family film it is uh for no children dance. Yep, it's a beautiful film. Uh, just you know, you might tear up, uh, but you're dealing with a very real, you know, very real thing, which is that we're all gonna die. It's a real fact. Mm. Thank you, Ben. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Side by Side podcast. Up next, we're gonna be watching another film, y'all. It's Needle in a Time Stack. It, ben. Ben, I'm still on the air. Ben's like taking a call from his family. Okay. <sighs> Whatever. Okay. It's Needle Needle in a Time Stack, directed by John Ridley. And it's got a cast of all stars, which is crazy to me. The cast of all stars are Leslie Odom Jr., Frida Pinto, Cynthia Arriva, Orlando Bloom, and Jaden Wong. It's on Amazon Prime, but for some reason, uh, the Rotten Tomato score is a little low for the girls. So we're going to go watch it and just do a little unpacking and figure that out. So be sure to watch Needle in a Time Stack by John Ridley on Amazon Prime. And we will see y'all next week for the show. Bye, y'all. Still watch it. Sorry if I made that sound bad. We're watching it. Bye.